Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, housekeeping issues. First, uh, I've just turned off my mobile phone, so I would invite everybody else to do the same or put it on silent. Um, the exits, exit is the door you came in through. So in the event of any emergency, please leave by the same door. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, Professor Hurt's address will be on the record, and when we go to a question and answer session afterwards, that will be off the record and is to remain uh, within the room. My apologies to you for being a little late starting. We had a very interesting informal discussion over lunch, and I was not firm enough in bringing it to a conclusion. <laughs> Uh, properly, but I have to be firm in bringing this session to a conclusion at two o'clock, so my apologies for taking up so much time. Our guest today is um, a person with considerable influence in the discussion of uh, financial structures uh, in the Eurozone. Uh, Professor Hurt is uh, a member of the uh, Bundestag in Germany, uh, a member of the CDU, uh, he's Deputy Chair of the Committee on Legal Affairs and Consumer Protection. He's a member of the Committee on European Union Affairs, and he chairs that committee's subcommittee on European um, Legal Affairs. In addition to that, he's a Professor of Law at the University of Hamburg, where he focuses on commercial law and especially on insolvency law. And he holds law degrees from the University of Cologne, from the University of Vienna and from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he is also uh, extremely well connected uh, with both analytical and decision-making circles, both in Germany and in the European Union, and is therefore in an extremely good position uh, to talk to us about the future of the European Monetary Fund Essentials, Expectations and Beyond. Um, some of us probably have greater expectations than he will think are justified. So with that, I give the floor to you, Professor Hurt. <coughs> yes. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for the nice words. I don't know the person you are talking about. So, um, and, uh, but I hope I come close to it at the end of my lecture. Um, you asked me to give some inside views about the monetary union and uh, some other topics uh, related to it. And I think it's a very good point to talk on this because last week in Germany we had a change in the leadership uh, of our parliamentary group of the Christian Democratic and Christian Social Unions parliamentary group from Volker Kauder to Ralph Brinkhaus. Both are member, as I am, of the um, business law circle of our parliamentary group, uh, but Ralph Binkhaus is a much more exposed uh, politician uh, to financial issues. And in particular, what helped him uh, to become the leader of, the, uh, parliamentary, of our parliamentary group was a paper which he presented, I think it was in March, on questions of the reform of the European Union. The paper was probably circulated around the world, I'm pretty sure of this. Um, and he made a couple of points, and I contributed to this paper in some points because as I'm working in the Committee of the Judiciary on questions of insolvency law, uh, which are related to questions of the monetary union and on questions of banking law, which are also related uh, to the monetary union, some of my uh, comments are integrated in this paper. And it was discussed in our parliamentary group, and it got a formal, more or less formal approval. It's mostly sounding no formal votes, which is easier, um, and uh, it failed the consent of the Social Democrats. Um, but what was clear was, prior to the Meisenberg meeting with the French Prime Minister, uh, was that this is the guidance which our parliamentary group is giving the government. Uh, and uh, I think uh, relatively clear uh, that uh, it helped uh, our Chancellor uh, to follow the line which her own parliamentary group had defined. And now that uh, Ralph Brinkhaus is the leader of this parliamentary group, I'm pretty sure that the basis of this paper will much more formally be integrated in the future discussion. What are the key points of this paper and of our discussion 
with regard to the European Union. Let's uh, say that the first and most important point, and this is what we discussed uh, very intensively in Parliament, uh, is the question whether the reform of the European monetary uh, system can be on the basis of Article 352 of the TT, uh, TFEU or whether it requires a modification of the treaty. Uh, we made very early clear that in our view, regardless of all, let's say, legal reasoning, uh, we think it does only work on the basis of a change of the EU treaty. Uh, so that requires the consent of the national parliaments. And uh, for the time being, this consent is not impossible, but it's probably depending on a, matter, on a couple of different matters which are all related to each other. And I will mention a couple of them. What could work, and uh, the proposal which was drafted by the European Union would not exclude this, is a model like we see it with the EIB and the ECB. So an independent institution, but mainly not directly dependent on the European Commission. The trust, the distrust, for historical reasons understandable, is that the European Commission, with different and with the Brexit changing majorities, might have a direct impact on German budget. This is what we see as the major concern. Uh, and uh, some of us say uh, that it's evenly, it might be unconstitutional. You never know and you can never anticipate constitutional court's decisions. But there is a certain risk uh, that if we were about to agree to such a change, uh, the German Constitutional Court might, might tell us that it ought to be in conflict with the German Constitution because we don't have or we wouldn't have any more the consent and the possibility to influence the uh, German budget directly. So what we need is the direct control of the national parliament, the ultimate control um, under constitutional law. What we secondly need um, is a conditionality. So if uh, money is going out of the fund, um, we need a conditionality that money goes out only on the price at the condition of reforms. Economically speaking, um, because there is no external control, like uh, in the normal credit relationship, um, and since this is not present, we did a substitute for the external control, and that's the conditionality. We had this with Greece, Ireland, and so on, and it worked differently. Uh, and uh, our, let's say, position in the uh, group, in our parliamentary group, is there are some objectors uh, against uh, all these programs, but the large majority, even within my parliamentary group, said and says, uh, the experience has shown us uh, that the programs were successful. Greece was, because I have been in Parliament uh, since uh, 2013, was the most problematic case. And since, since I have good friends in Greece, uh, and I know the discussion even within Greece, I know some of the reasons for this, because uh, it has to, had to go the longest way. And at the very beginning, and this is one point which one has to repeat uh, um, uh, uh, anymore, uh, over and over again, um, and at the very beginning it was problematic to ac have accepted Greece to the European Union, but there were external foreign polit political reasons for doing so. The third point is crisis prevention, and that's probably the most problematic, because in a crisis you relatively easily get a consensus on uh, what you have to do, because you have to do the crisis away, we have to fight it, but all these other measures are um, less visible and the effects are less foreseeable. Um, so what we need is a supervision of the program states um, and uh, in, uh, after money has been lent out. And uh, the question is who is going to do this instead of the Troika which, is, uh, which has done this so far. Um, so that you need some reliable supervision in case uh, we are going in this direction. The, the point is uh, that, at least for me personally, because I know persons doing this supervision process, 
um, the reliability of the uh, control mechanisms was not as um, reliable, the reliability was not as uh, good as it should have been. You got, uh, to make it very, um, to illustrate it, uh, if you have been to Greece as a tourist, you saw that the reports which you got on Greece uh, two or three years ago uh, via the European Commission uh, were completely different, uh, and that the tax system did not work because you experienced the tax system as a tourist in every restaurant. Uh, you know and you saw uh, that it did not work to the same extent as we were told as politicians. So there is a gap which has to be closed and that would be helpful and necessary to uh, increase the trust on the reform which in general uh, we, as, uh, uh, we as parliamentary group uh, and we as German parliament uh, gave our consent to. The fourth point is maybe uh, the most controversial one, because we say that the, um, that the um, reform of the, or the introduction of a real European monetary fund has to be connected to a reform of the sovereign, sovereign debt restructuring system. Um, and uh, you already mentioned that uh, I'm uh, I used to be a scholar uh, for commercial law and insolvency law, and that I worked on questions of uh, sovereign debt restructuring for many, many years. And what we did is we said one of the, let's say, external control factors, con conditionality is one point, uh, but the very end, the backstop in a way, uh, needs to be a restructuring, a complete restructuring, and this is what we lack. Uh, there were proposals by the World Bank on this, um, and some of them had been uh, readjusted and uh, presented uh, as, as uh, measures which could be inter integrated in the EMF uh, system by Christoph Paulus, a colleague of mine in Berlin, um, into the European Central Bank. Sovereign debt uh, restructuring uh, is a key question because it uh, would end uh, the, it, it would limit, to some extent, the risk of financing by state money. So I come to some points of this uh, in a minute later. And the fifth important point is um, that my parliamentary group uh, would not accept the uh, monetary fund as a backstop uh, for the single resolution fund. And that goes to the second broad point, which I want to make the question of relationship to other questions, which is the banking union. Because banking and uh, state financing are uh, closely related to each other. So let me turn to the question of the banking union and all questions of the deposit insurance scheme. The question for me as a scholar and as a politician, and as what we said, because we already, as a German parliament and Bundestag uh, and German government already agreed upon this, is not a yes or no. Um, there are arguments for a social security, uh, not, sorry, for a deposit insurance scheme, uh, and there are good ec uh, economic uh, arguments for this, but the question is when and how. And the key question is, sorry, that for the time being, it's uh, too early uh, to discuss this and to, in, uh, to initiate this, because the reduction um, of uh, risk has to be first, and sharing of risk is the second point. And the reduction of risk is one of the points uh, in which I have been working extensively, because as a responsible person for insolvency law in the German parliament, we have been discussed this for, for years, and I was closely uh, involved in the discussion of the uh, restructuring directive, which is now about to come uh, on the European level under the auspices of, uh, of uh, insolvency law. So what we need prior uh, to a deposit insurance scheme uh, is a, a harmonization of insolvency law in Europe, which includes 
a harmonization, a uh, reduction for many countries of the amount of non-performing loans. Um, and the question of a more quicker use of collateral uh, in order to reduce the, the number of non-performing, the amount of non-performing loans in Europe. We have a discussion sometimes whether it has to be the three to five percent which we have in Germany, or whether there are some other figures uh, which you could uh, use as a, let's say, um, standard figure to be approached first. Uh, from what I see, there is no agreement yet that it has to be a specific figure, uh, so that there is some uh, discretion on how far the reduction should work. And we know, and I know, uh, that the figure is dependent on other issues as well. And uh, what we discussed previously, uh, or what we discussed prior to the, the, my talk here uh, on lunch, during lunch, is we are certainly aware of the fact uh, that the question of how far you perform loans or whether how, how far you enforce the performing of loans is dependent on the social security systems in the different states. So there is a relationship between both. And the more the one system works, the less you need uh, the private financing. But you have to take this into account. A point which I made in this context um, is, and I made this to, to the Commission, is um, if we are discussing the question of the insolvency system, uh, you have to take into account the different systems, the different approaches of crown privileges around Europe. The crown privilege means that in a private insolvency, the state has priority over others when collecting his uh, credit. Uh, and that means uh, that uh, harmonizing private insolvencies, which we need to harmonize in order to reduce the risks of banks, in order to, in the second step, reduce the risk of states, that this point may trigger a huge difference among the states. So I say, in order to get this harmonization, which we need, we need an equal rule uh, for the uh, state's insolvency, uh, for the crown privilege, for the position of the state in private insolvencies as well. My prediction is uh, that there will be no such rule, because the last bargaining process is, gonna, uh, is, is during these days. My prediction is that there will be no rule on this uh, in the... Um, in the insolvency and in the restructuring directive, which will certainly increase the uh, or reduce the chance uh, of uh, coming uh, more quickly to a deposit insurance scheme. And once again, more intensively here, um, we are discussing the question of uh, sovereign debt restructuring, um, which uh, is necessary in order to have banks' risks uh, shared among other banks and shared with the states. Um, and uh, if you don't know this, uh, I was uh, first, when I told this, uh, or when I, when I offered this idea, um, there was a very, uh, let's say, um, high uh, refusal, particularly uh, among uh, some state representatives and among the European Central Bank, um, and uh, what I was surprised of is uh, that at some point I got an invitation by the European Central Bank to discuss this in an internal meeting. Uh, and we had a conference of one day in the ECB and the British uh, and, and the Irish uh, Bank of Ireland was present as well because it was a meeting by the, uh, by the uh, central bank system to discuss all the options. And uh, the uh, outcome is published in a, in a book which you can find on the ECB's uh, homepage with all the proposals. And one of the proposals was, as I mentioned, to integrate, uh, to reform the European money fund, uh, the, 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 to reform the monetary, to, to integrate it uh, in a European monetary fund and uh, as a second step or as the ultimate step. Uh, and so, a solution of this point is, in our view, at least in most of my colleagues' views, uh, a necessity in order to move forward with a deposit insurance scheme. What you see in the Meseberg Declaration, that was the German-French, uh, that was the German-French 
uh, meeting in June, uh, is that even the French now agreed on some steps toward such a uh, insolvency proceeding for states. Uh, and one step is the single limb aggregation, uh, which would allow, which would permit much more easily than before the, uh, uh, the restructuring of sovereign debt. And related to this is risk adjustment, risk adjustment of sovereign debt, and the, um, uh, class, the avoidance of cluster risks uh, in the uh, bank's, uh, in the bank's uh, balance sheets. So if you don't come to a real proceeding, what you have to do, you have to uh, get more transparency of the type of, uh, of the type of credit which you have in your uh, books. So these are the points which in my parliamentary group's view are, have to be resolved prior to come to a deposit insurance scheme. So uh, you look at your watch, if I see this correctly. Not yet, because then I could add one other point uh, before I leave it up to the discussion. <laughs> Banking union and uh, insolvency is a relationship which I wanted to make. And the third which I wanted to make, which is uh, strongly related to the question of uh, the, uh, um, of the uh, monetary union. The third point which I wanted to make is uh, the um, unemployment scheme question. Unemployment is uh, in Germany one of the most, let's say, controversial questions because the proposal of the European Union uh, to introduce a, um, a European unemployment scheme uh, triggers a lot of um, dissent, triggers a lot of controversy, uh, saying uh, that uh, it's not the task of German employers, employees uh, to subsidize uh, the unemployed around Europe. That's uh, the short version. And um, we know uh, that uh, crisis uh, hit states differently, and we know that there has to be money available in these cases and that there has to be um, a certain, let's say, um, common responsibility um, in these extreme cases. The question, however, is uh, whether this can be done in the classical way uh, and whether, whether we sh could introduce easily a, um, a system, uh, a European-wide unemployment system. And uh, our position is for sure that this is not the correct or not the, the uh, it's not the, the answer so that we could not introduce a collective system of employees responsible for the unemployment all over Europe. Mr. Scholz, the finance minister, mentioned that there is an alternative possibility, uh, which is a sort of a backup solution as we have it in some US states, uh, which is not a direct responsibility, but it's only a, a backup responsibility, a backup financing of the national uh, un, uh, unemployment uh, uh, insurance systems. Um, I cannot say for sure yet uh, whether this would uh, help uh, solve the problems and whether this is an acceptable solution for my parliamentary group. What I can say is uh, that uh, the question of unemployment, uh, particularly by, uh, among younger people in southern Europe, is a real problem for the acceptance of Europe. Uh, that, on the other hand, uh, the so a solution of this problem uh, would help increasing uh, the um, acceptance of the idea of the European Union. So a political solution would definitely be helpful in order to keep Europe united. My personal answer was uh, that I looked at the German insolvency system, where in the case of insolvency of a, uh, of a business, uh, there is a possibility of the state uh, to give a sort of a credit uh, for the employees for the first three months after an insolvency, which helps overcome the main risk, which is the direct risk, the immediate risk of an insolvency immediately after an insolvency. 
This is called the so-called Insolvenzgeld for Finanzierung. And I said, why not thinking about getting this system, which only uh, helps uh, struggling the immediate hit of an insolvency of your employer, uh, thinking of uh, expo not exporting, but uh, taking this as an example, rather as uh, financing or coping this, the problem of long-term uh, unemployment. So that could be an idea where we could go, uh, where, we, where we could come together, because unemployment, short-term unemployment, short-term risks are one of the risks, one of the key risks uh, for the monetary reunion, and are another point which should be focused at in order to avoid the risks where a European monetary fund, monetary fund uh, would have or could have could be obliged to pay. So, I gave you, I hope, a range of uh, problems related to each other. Um, all of them are difficult, all of them are controversial, and I'm pretty sure that you will have a couple of comments, asks, corrections, uh, or suggestions, uh, which I would uh, like to take home. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion.